Hey everyone, welcome to another video. Today I'm going to be talking about how to free yourself from your cable or satellite provider. Now for my regular viewers, please don't get discouraged about this video. I'm not going to continue to make videos about this. This is just a specialty video. In fact, if you keep watching it, I'm sure you will be impressed because there's going to be a surprise within this video that you guys have been requesting for a while. Anyways, getting back to the video and task at hand, I'm going to show you how to save a buttload of money by essentially getting rid of your satellite provider, cable provider, whatever paid TV provider you have, Time Warner, Comcast, who cares, and switching to over the air by installing a rooftop antenna. Now attic mounts work too, but I'm going to be talking about roof mount today. First things first, let's talk about what we're going to talk about overall. First off, we're going to talk about finding your broadcast towers. Uh, yes, we have to figure out where they are so we can direct the antenna to that. So with that said, we have to then talk about antennas and signals and video quality and oh my, hopefully I didn't lose you guys already. I'm going to break it down, we're going to talk about it piece by piece, so hopefully you guys can understand the differences and the things that go into ensuring you have a great TV watching experience with over the air and don't have those nasty breakups that you're probably experiencing right now or have experienced in the past with analog or other digital experimentations you've done. And we're also going to talk about video quality. Uh, a lot of people have this notion that uh, they think about their parents' television and how it was all fuzzy and ghosty and just looked like crap. Uh, quite honestly, that's a myth nowadays with digital. Your video quality is actually better, and I'll talk about that a little bit later as well. So then we're going to show you my over-the-air system. I'm going to actually, piece by piece, walk you around my home and uh, show you my cable setup as well as my antenna setup. Then we're going to talk about digital video recorders or DVR systems. Most of you already know what these are because you probably have them with your current cable or satellite provider. But a lot of people don't want to lose them, so they continue to pay basically the money for those systems, not realizing that they sell these systems in stores or online. You can buy these systems without having to pay that price. Uh, so I'm going to talk about that a little bit. And then we're also going to talk about cable alternatives. Obviously, everyone knows about Netflix and Hulu and stuff like that. So I'm going to go a little bit more in depth and talk about what they can offer you in the sense of subsidizing cable and the overpriced stuff that it is, in a sense. Then we're going to break down the savings. How much will you actually save by doing this? I have a couple different scenarios. And um, overall, it's going to be very dynamic relative to your situation. So hopefully you'll be able to pick out the scenario that fits you best and uh, kind of take it from there. So first of all, we're going to talk about antennas and signals. What do you need to do to find out which antenna you need? Because that's probably the question that's going out through everyone's mind right now is where do I even begin? So first things first, you have to find your antenna's location. All right, so I found them. Uh, okay, maybe not literally find them. And tvfool.com does a pretty good job of that, but we're going to use a couple different sources. So first of all, as you can see, TV Fool provides me with a lot of technical data right here uh, relative to the networks that I'm looking at. And this is very important because this will tell me uh, which frequency these TV or these, these stations are broadcasting on. Now you're probably wondering, well, why does that matter to me? I can just go and buy an antenna and it should work, right? Wrong. Uh, as you can see here, relative to this graph, there are two different bandways. We have VH, or technically three, I guess. We have three, or we have VHF low, VHF high, and then we have the UHF bandwave right here. Now, normally antennas receives, all HD antennas, or all antennas in general, receive UHF uh, bandwaves, at least nowadays. But not all receive VHF. So if you have, like I do in my area, a VHF channel, as you can see channel 11, that is in the VHF spectrum, spectrum you're going to need to make sure you get an antenna that's going to be able to pick that up. And that's where this really, really helps out. And not only does it do that, but it tells you using a graph and color coded wise, which stations you can realistically pick up in your area. Uh, and which ones you're just not going to be able to pick up. And as you can see right here, these are extremely far away. Uh, and there's just no way that I'm going to be able to pick these up without going to really, really extreme measures and having my yard just filled with antennas and probably having a 50, 60 foot mast in my yard, which is not realistic. So moving on, they also offer a nice map that shows you graphically wise very similar to weather radar, and, and the color coding is pretty much identical too. As you can see, the purples out here are where the signal is extremely weak to the point of you're really not gonna be able to pick that up. You might get a blip or two, but 
realistically, you're just not going to pick anything up out here. Uh, over here, as long as you have a high enough mast on your antenna and a large enough antenna, you should be able to pick up these stations a little bit, but that's going to those extreme measures again. And then obviously you can see in the greens here, we're definitely getting into the areas uh, where it's realistically possible to pick up these stations with rooftop measures. And then the yellows and reds, which are more uh, in the general broadcast area where you can just kind of set an antenna on your TV and in a good day, not really have many issues with it. Maybe a break up here too, but for the most part, your TV signal will come in very good. And as you can see right in my area, around here, um, I have a lot of signal. So that, that is really good. Now, this is also a nice chart down here because this tells you what the uh, curvature of the earth or the terrain is in a two dimensional uh, sort of spectrum. So you can see right over here, we have the broadcast tower, which is a very hot, very white uh, signal. And as we then taper off, Doing, due to the curvature of the earth, you can actually see how that signal is bouncing off the earth and is not able to get exactly where I am, which is on this side of the chart. So this is, chart is always gonna be relative to the tower's location and your location. That is how to read them. It took me a while to figure it out. Um, maybe I'm just that stupid, but uh, nevertheless, that is how you read it. And uh, this shows very, very nicely, as you can see some of the, the hills and valleys, how the signal interacts with that. Uh, such as over here, you can see there's a small little valley where you might not get as good a signal. Uh, so, and I actually have kind of that situation in my location here. All right, so another site that we can use here because this still doesn't answer the question of, well, I've kind of done some Google searching and I found these different wacky antennas. Which one do I buy? So here's the type of antenna. Here's if you want a one-stop shop in a sense to pick up the type of antenna you need, go to Antenna Web. And I think it's antennaweb.org. I'll have the links in the description for you guys for all these sites and stuff like that. Essentially what it'll do is it'll give you a straight line, it'll chart and map out all the antennas in your location and which type of antenna you need. And if you click on the channel, it will then give you a informational chart or, or blip in a sense that can tell you, in this case, I need a small multi-directional antenna. Boom, there you go. You now know relative to your area, which type of antenna you need to realistically pick that up. Now, unfortunately, this is nice, but there's still a little bit more in the way of terrain, objects, and things like that that can interfere with your TV watching experience. So before we get into that, we're gonna talk about, well, I guess we'll get into it within this slide right here, the different types of antennas, and if they don't have it in the description, because I've done some Google searches, and antennas are very vague sometimes uh, in their way of describing which type they actually are. So here's a good way of telling which type they actually are. Directional antennas, the design typically is gonna be your classic antenna that you're thinking of. You got the elements kind of spoking out to the sides and then tapering off towards the front of the antenna. That's just your typical directional antenna. These have a viewing radius in the sense of signal roughly within about a 90 degree area. So anything wider than that, uh, you're definitely not gonna be able to pick up with this or it'll be very, very weak. Multi-directional antennas, they have a viewing angle of 180 degrees, making them a lot more uh, preferred if you live in an area with towers that are split apart. And we'll see an illustration of that a little bit later. But overall, the design of them, you will see that they have more of a kind of flat type of, they have more surface area and they're more vertical. And they also have reflectors on the back, most likely. Now, it's not all of them do, but um, most likely you will see a reflector on the back of them to try to keep down some of the multi-path uh, issues, which would cause your TV to break up. And then on here, this is a VHF capable antenna. So it has the VHF rods due to the fact that VHF is a lower frequency wave and needs more surface area to be picked up versus UHF, which is this little kind of figure eight you see in the middle there. Last but not least, you have omnidirectional antennas. These obviously can receive, as you can see by the shape, signals 365 degrees. So if you are in a metropolitan area where you just have signal everywhere you go, this is probably gonna be your best bet just because it's gonna pick up signal everywhere. Now keep in mind the distances for all these are greatly reduced uh, due to their design or stuff like that. If you go to, with omnidirectional antenna versus a directional, uh, directional is gonna get you the most in the sense of distance versus multi-directional, which is gonna kind of be right in the middle in a sense. And then omnidirectional is not gonna get you that, that distance that you need due to the fact that it's gonna pick up other interfering signals as well as the signal you wanna pick up. So you kind of have to, to put all this information together uh, relative to your location 
and then that will go ahead and tell you which antenna to buy. But oh wait, we're not done. Remember that illustration I saw? This will also help you uh, determine which antenna you will need relative to your location. So if your antennas are, your, your towers are grouped together in one, typically a directional antenna will get the job done for you. Uh, and if you're within basically or more than 50 miles, you're pretty much definitely going to need a directional antenna. Uh, no other antenna is going to be that uh, be powerful enough and focus that signal down enough for the, you to actually get that signal. So you're definitely going to need a directional then. So if you live closer to the towers uh, and you have a lot of foliage, things like that, like I have. Uh, now, some people state that if you have more foliage, sometimes directional antennas are better. In my case, I had a directional antenna up there and I found that this multi-directional one has some so far done a lot better uh, with the multi-path in my area and you'll see that a little bit later but for the most part if you have antennas a sure sign that you need a multi-path uh, multi antenna is if you have antennas that are split apart so they're not grouped together within a specific location uh, but essentially you need to receive a signal from antennas that are farther apart or in two different locations and this is realistically what my scenario is and it's not necessarily the the distance between the antennas as they are um, within about 10 miles of each other, it's because I'm so close to the towers too that poses me in that kind of gray area in a sense of a directional antenna. I can point it at one and point at another, but it's kind of hard to get in that, that window. Um, but I also think that there were some issues in my situation of multi-path due to where I had it mounted. Uh, so I can't confirm that, but all I can tell you is the way I have it set up right now is working and um, how I would recommend you guys setting it up. And then obviously, last but not least, we have the omnidirectional scenario down here where you have antennas pretty much surrounding you or transmitters surrounding you and you want to pick up that signal. All right. So let's see what else do we need to look at when buying an antenna. This is very important, guys. So remember we talked about earlier picking up UHF, VHF frequencies? Well, Look at the technical data of your antenna. It will be very informational. Now you're probably looking at this right now thinking to yourself, seriously, you want me to actually read this and understand this? I think I would have a better time understanding some Egyptian hieroglyphs than this stuff. Well, you know, you may be right, but I'm gonna explain it to you and hopefully give you the information that you need because a lot of the stuff you don't really need, it's a few things on here that you do in order to pick up the right antenna. So all you need to do is look at the electrical data right here in this case. Look at the band wave that the antenna will receive. Make sure that if you have a UHF or have a VHF channel that it's going to state both UHF and VHF. Right down here it states it, up here it doesn't. So in my case, if I were to buy this antenna, granted it does have a little bit more gain, it would not necessarily pick up that channel 11 that I have in my area. So I would not be able to get my local Fox affiliate. Now I live so close that it might pick it up. Um, but for the most part, you might experience breakup and other issues associated with the fact that you aren't technically supposed to be receiving that, uh, you don't have the capabilities to receive a VHF band wave. Now, if we look down here at the antenna I did purchase and have up on my roof right now, uh, this one definitely has the VHF capabilities, viewing seven through 13 channels, and then it also has the UHF capabilities as well. So this was definitely antenna I need to buy and the, definitely the one I did buy. And as you can see, here is a picture of my antenna mounted up on its mast uh, on the roof on the side of my chimney. Now, you're probably asking yourselves right now, well, what is that J bracket doing on there? Well, guys, for the past year, like I said, I've been kind of researching doing this kind of stuff. And, um, well, this chimney is sheet metal. And for those of you who don't know this, and a lot of people are already cringing at me right now and saying, how could you not know this? When you have radio frequencies such as TV broadcasts, you want to avoid metal objects as much as possible. And I'm not talking about like a simple pole like this. No, I'm talking about very wide surface area objects, such as a chimney, uh, metal roofs, buildings, things like that. Avoid, stay away from them as much as possible, or at least a minimum of, in this case, of two feet, realistically, is what you want to do. Uh, because the signal, what it'll do is, as you can see here, this is where I had it mounted. Yeah, this is, no, don't do this. Because what's going to happen here, and let me get my little, what is it, let me see if I can find it. Oh, I can't find it. Oh, well. Um, so realistically, what's going to happen is, you're going to have signal coming at the antenna. Okay, from the transmitter towers. It's gonna end up hitting this metal chimney as well and it will reflect back 
at the antenna, creating what's called short delay multipath. Essentially, you're getting the same signal hitting that antenna twice within usually a small like 20, 10 millisecond delay. The tuner, when it sees this, just goes absolutely berserk. Now, this used to not be a problem with analog TV. You, you know, might get a little bit of ghosting, and a little bit of fuzziness here and there, but for the most part, you can still easily understand them and easily see the picture. Well, with digital broadcast nowadays, multipath is just the devil when it comes to digital tuners. It just is. They're very sensitive to it. Some tuners are better than others at filtering it out. But essentially, if the tuner sees too much in the way of uh, interference and it cannot re-replicate re those packets properly, it's just gonna it's just gonna say I, I can't do it, and, and it's just gonna drop the signal entirely. It cannot replicate them if it if it can't get through the errors. It's just gonna drop. Now you're always gonna get errors. You're always gonna have a little bit of multipath, but if you have too much, in my case, like I did here, you're gonna get break up. Now, typically when it's windier, you will see this. So if your signal's breaking up when the wind picks up it's a good chance that you're experiencing short delay multipath and need to relocate your antenna or get a better antenna. So in my case, I went with a multi-directional. Some people, like I said, state that directionals are better, but in my experience here, and from what I read on antennasdirect.com, they state that their antenna is designed to get through thick, thick foliage. And uh, in this next image, you will see that I have thick foliage in my yard. Lots of trees, lots of shrubs and other stuff that woodland creatures just go crazy over so you get my point i live pretty much in the forest uh, and now i do have a broadcast tower i believe somewhere over here as well as somewhere over here relative to the current degrees that it is pointed at and right now i have no problem and uh, we had a windstorm was it uh, not too long ago and it did break up a little bit but it was before i put this mast up keep in mind it was before i moved the antenna so it still was on this crazy little contraption over here and it only broke up a couple times a day it realistically wasn't that bad uh, so I was quite surprised and this setup right here um, once I set this up immediately today my signal was only usually about in the 90s uh, sometimes in the 80s or drop to but the minute I hooked it up no matter really where I turned it as long as it was within 180 degrees of those towers it was it was perfectly fine signal never budged from 100 a, a bit I actually had to turn the antenna basically all the way uh, due south for the most part before it even started going to the 90s on the station that is essentially broadcast from the farthest tower to my north that is that is how important keeping it away from other metal objects is so now because I don't want to go on the roof and make a video about this right now I'm gonna talk about it right here let's talk about the mast now you can obviously go to your store or order online because they don't have them in stores for some weird reason I think I might open up a store that's just gonna sell chimney mounts because for those of you who've been looking in stores for chimney mounts have probably come up empty-handed don't know why no one stocks them I think they would be something that you'd put next to your antennas because it's kind of something that most people need however uh, you can buy these online through Amazon or other online retailers, but in my case, I just made my own. Not everybody's chimney is different. I have just a standard sheet metal chimney that I feel a lot of people do have. Uh, brick, as you can see my neighbors have right over here, is going to be a little bit more difficult to do a situation like this. You may want to just go with the chimney straps. It'll be a lot easier. You don't have to drill in your masonry and wreck your chimney. Uh, also keep in mind if you're going to do a chimney installation, that it's relative to the strength of your chimney. So if you have a weak chimney, um, you might not want to uh, put that antenna on there as it could cause further weakening and possible uh, be very detrimental to your chimney and um, well point blank basically putting it bluntly your antenna may end up in your yard or hanging out your bedroom window one morning if you do that and that brings me to the next point is make sure it's secure as you can see right here I went to my local hardware store and uh, to build mine I used some inch and a quarter uh, EMT conduit that's what I started out, and that ran me about $11. Then I just bought a, you know, about four brackets to hang that on a, typically a wall, and uh, those cost me about 30 cents a piece. So realistically, it's under $20 still. And then I just used a scrap 4x4 that I had as a shim, and I used sheet metal screws all over in here like crazy. Trust me, I was really reefing on this thing. <laughs> I, mean, I was gonna freaking pull the chimney out of the roof. I didn't want to reef on it anymore. Um, and essentially we have that installed securely so and also this is only about I think I haven't measured it officially because I did lop off some of the top it was a 10 foot section when I bought it for $11 so not that bad and I did cut it off a little bit just because 
I didn't want to put guy wires on it. And anything 10 feet or above, you realistically should have guy wires. And this chimney isn't exactly the sturdiest thing in the world, so if you have a sturdier chimney, you may be able to get away with not having any guy wires on your antenna, but due to the fact that uh, my chimney is not exactly the most sturdiest thing, being just thin sheet metal, um, it was kind of with 10 feet up there. It was it was not it was swaying around a little bit, uh, just kind of touching it. So I didn't want to leave that up there like that. Uh, cut it off. I think it's about seven and a half feet or so, something like that. Seven seven and a half feet tall, which still gets it away as you can see right here, plenty far away from the chimney. And and the biggest thing is the fact that there's nothing behind it now. So now the signal can go clean past it, anything that is not hitting the reflector and doesn't get that multipath that it was getting earlier. Because down here is just multipath city. You just stay away from the whole thing. All right, just just stay away from it, guys. It's it's bad news. So. All right, here we are, ready to head outside, take a look at what we have so we can get free TV throughout our house and not have to worry about adjusting each individual set-top antenna. Let's go take a look at what we have. All right, everyone, here we are outside and you can see we have the rooftop antenna mounted on the chimney. And over here, we in turn have our main feed line running down. And I apologize, the lighting is not to be desired, but the sun is kind of blinding everything. So, what do we have here? Well, we have our main feed line coming from our antenna, which in turn is going into our lightning suppression system. Uh, we have the lightning suppression system attached to a 12 gauge wire. Uh, this might actually be 10 gauge. Uh, going to a grounding rod, a four foot grounding rod in the ground, so that if any lightning were to hit the system, it would not affect my TVs, because that would be bad since you have everything connected to this one line. So, lightning suppression system, very important. Spend the extra money on that. Uh, we then have our splitter down here. This is then going to feed all of the TVs in the house. So this right here is going to a bedroom upstairs, as well as this one right down here is going to a bedroom upstairs, which is this cable line right here. Uh, we then have this line right here, which is headed to the family room, which is right in there, and that is the one that you saw on the channel master earlier. Uh, and then this line is the one that is feeding another splitter through uh, the, it's going to the basement of this house as well as the kitchen TV. So let's go take a look at that and see what we have over there. This is the rat's nest that is behind my air conditioning unit and installing this was not actually that difficult. Uh, anyways, you do see right here, we do have our one cable line that's feeding in and then in turn we have our other two lines that are one is feeding the basement and the other one is going into the TV in the kitchen right there. So that is pretty much the All system. All right, so I hope you enjoyed seeing my actual over the air system and how it's set up. So let's talk about parts now because a lot of you are probably thinking, well, what did you use for parts? I mean, I saw the little things and you were talking about the doodads and things like that, but I wanna know what are the parts? Well, here is the parts list relative pretty much to what you're going to need if you want to replicate my system. Now, I didn't include the mast stuff that uh, the mast components that I bought at the hardware store because uh, everyone's hardware store might be different. So realistically, I mentioned them already. We're just ignore that. And we're going to talk about the technical parts here. First things first, you need a lot of coax cable. Uh, you're, if you don't have an existing infrastructure, you're going to need a lot of cable. And even if you do, I would recommend redoing the ends of that uh, coax system just because it's going to get you a much better signal and for ends or for um yeah cable ends i don't know exactly why i don't know what they're called i guess i'm gonna call them compression fittings because that's realistically what they are so if you don't uh, have any compression fittings go ahead and get some and now you're probably asking yourself too right now well why couldn't i just use little screw on ones i mean they're just very easy you just open up the package you cut the cable and you screw them on please don't use those guys please don't you're gonna you're just save yourself a whole bunch of hassle if you go with the compression ones. And the reason being is these are weather tight. These are rated for satellite and they will keep that signal clean. As you all know, moisture and water is the enemy of electronics and electrical anything. And if you get water in there, it can go ahead and short out that signal and dissipate it to the point where you will not get a clean signal anymore. So please use the compression fittings. Spend the extra money. I know this price is gonna probably scare you right now, but don't be scared about it. It's not that bad, trust me. We're gonna, we're gonna get that price down quite a bit. So then you're gonna need some RG6 crimpers uh, in order to put these ends on your cable and expose your superconductor, or your superconductor, jeez. 
I am just going crazy in that, aren't I? So you can expose your center conductor. There we go. That sounds a little bit more realistic, right? Uh, you're going to also need some crimping tools. So you got your crimping tool right here and then your compression fitting tool. Essentially, you just stick the cable right in there and squeeze down. Boom. Done. Easy. Um, it's really kind of fun, I think, to make these. I don't know why. It's a little cork, I guess, but whatever. Um, I think it's kind of fun to make those. Anyways, moving on here, what else are you going to need? Now we're starting to get into the devices, actually, the things that are going to make your, your over-the-air network uh, perform really good and also make it safe. So first things first, let's talk about safety. You're going to want to get a surge protector or some sort of lightning suppression system. Guys, we have a metal object protruding through, through your chimney, so or at least your roof in general. You're going to want to have some sort of lightning protection. And I know they have grounding blocks for like a you know, couple cents or so, but that's not going to necessarily protect you in my mind. And not, I may be wrong on this, but I just have this you know, this thing about lightning and electricity, I would feel much more confident, I feel much more confident having a surge protector in my system because I know that if it gets hit by lightning, that surge protector is going to stop that lightning and it's not going to affect any of my devices. Now, this also does obviously work as a grounding block. And for those of you who are thinking to yourself, well, I can just skip that step. That's not really that important. I just want to get hooked up and let's get it going. Um, please don't skip this step. Um, that is if you don't want to be buying new TVs and DVRs and all these other electronic components every so often, every couple years or so, because your tuners keep failing due to the static buildup in the antenna from the wind blowing by it. As crazy as it sounds, it is possible. Uh, and this will dissipate that charge into the ground. And obviously, with that said, you're going to need to get a grounding rod. Now, I didn't show it in here, but you can go to your hardware store and pick one of those up for about 20 bucks or so. They're not terribly expensive. Obviously, the next thing that's quite important is we're going to need a splitter of some kind. Now, I got a four-way splitter because it suited my needs perfectly fine, as you saw, and got the cables and signal where it needed to go. You can obviously get more in the way of termination points, but keep in mind the more termination points you have and the more times you split a cable, the lower the signal strength will get. So if you have too long of a run or you have too many signals that are being split, you're going to have to go buy a preamp, which is going to essentially amplify that signal of the antenna's uh, gain and then distribute it throughout your system and then your TVs will be able to pick it up and you can adjust that via um, adjustments on the actual device, but you also need AC power to that in order to add electrical current to it. It's got to come from somewhere, right? So that, that is also a something to keep in mind. Now, probably the most important thing, and probably the thing that a lot of you are thinking, why didn't you mention it first, is the antenna itself. Now, in my case, I have the antenna's direct clear stream 2V on my roof right now, and I think it's phenomenal, at least compared to the RCA antenna I used to have up there. But some of you may have a different opinion. Uh, and also... It's going to run you about $100. It is a little bit more expensive, the antenna. They do have one that does not have a mast for $89. That is the one I purchased, or $90 realistically. And um, I built my own mast. So you can do it relative to your situation, or purchase the one that is relative to your situation, I should say. And then last but not least, we have the TiVo Bolt. And this is a DVR system that will enable you to record your shows and it's going to cost you $299 for the actual device itself and then $599 if you want the lifetime DVR plan or $149 a year for a subscription depending on which one you choose. Now I guess I would probably go with the $600 one just because I want to get it paid off and the idea of this is to kind of prevent monthly bills. So just get it paid off and then you're good to go. But that's my recommendation. You can do it financially as best for you. Add all this up, and you can see it comes to $1,239 to set up a system. And this might be a little bit much for some people. I mean, you might be able to do this for a little bit less, depending on the components you buy, but this is roughly what it's going to cost. And, um, oh, I failed to mention, too, it's obviously in the description, but uh, the cable, I priced it out for mono price. I got a buddy that was able to give me the cable, uh, lend me some, so very appreciative of him for doing that and being so nice. But uh, monoprice.com does have... This cable, 1,000 feet for $154, roughly. Which brings me to my next slide, and we're going to talk about the DVR options you have for recording TV. A lot of people already know what DVRs are, and they have them with their current cable or satellite provider, which might be the kind of incentive to not get them, or not to ditch them. Well, 
you can get them through stores. A lot of people don't know this, and you don't need your cable or satellite provider involved at all. You can just kick them out, get them out. They're just, they've overstayed their welcome, okay, guys? So get them out of here, go and get yourself a DVR, and just record over the air shows um, at no extra cost. Now, obviously, the TiVo does have that extra cost, but the Channel Master does not, as you can see right here, no subscription fees. So we'll go ahead and break down the Channel Master's features and uh, perks and things like that. First of all, they have two different models. They come in either 16 gigabyte or one terabyte internal storage. Now, 16 gigabytes is relatively useless when it comes to recording HD video because you can't even really record an hour show on that. Um, you're not gonna get much in the way of recordings at all. Trust me, you aren't. So with that said, they were luckily at least smart enough, the engineers over there, well, somewhat smart over there. They put a USB port on the back and the capabilities of connecting a external hard drive in which you can connect one, two, three terabytes. I don't know what the limit is, but in a sense, you have infinite storage capabilities because you can continue to buy external hard drives relative to the amount of recordings you have. It also comes with internet channels and built-in apps such as Netflix and YouTube. And um, I do have the Channel Master right now. Those internet channels are mediocre at best. The only one that I am really interested in is Weather Nation, which is kind of a piss poor version of the weather channel but uh, what are you gonna do it, it it's pretty decent and sometimes the it does kind of pause and buffer and stuff like that it's brand new they kind of just started it not too long ago price wise what are we looking at it's gonna cost you about $250 for the 16 gigabyte model versus $400 for the one terabyte model personally guys I would just go with the 16 gigabyte model as hard drives are expanding rapidly and exponentially you can just upgrade the hard drive then relative to what you want to record instead of having to buy a whole new unit once again the biggest biggest feature i think about the dvr plus from channel master is no subscription fees yes when you buy the thing you set it up right out of the box and that is it you plug it in scan for channels and you are ready to go pretty easy you can record two shows at once yeah whoop de freaking do i should just take that off the features list because so can every other dvr out there Let's move on to the Channel Master, or not Channel Master, the TiVo. I'm getting all these things jumbled up now, so let's straighten this out. TiVo Bolt, what is it gonna offer you? Well, it comes in two different models, 500 gigabyte, one terabyte, so a little bit more than Channel Master is gonna give you. The coolest thing about the TiVo Bolt is for those of you who don't know this, skip mode. That is one button you press on there and it skips all the commercials. You go from the end of your show to the start of your show, skipping the commercial break entirely. I am not able to try this out yet, but I really, really want to, and I find this to be a really cool feature if it actually does work how they state it does. It also does come with built-in apps, such as the you know Netflix, YouTube, Hulu, things like that. And in fact, it also has Amazon Video, so it has a lot more in the way of online streaming apps than a Channel Master offers. Uh, so that's a nice feature too. It also has built-in Wi-Fi, as the Channel Master does not. The Channel Master, you must connect it to a Ethernet port or purchase a external Wi-Fi adapter for, I believe, is fifty dollars. Yeah, and everyone just knows how to wire, you know, Cat6 cable. So, yeah, you're pretty much going to be stuck forking out fifty dollars, right? And the TiVo does have that external USB port for external hard drives. So once again, I would recommend just going with the 500 gigabyte model and not breaking the bank on the one terabyte. But that is just my opinion because I feel that I could get a two terabyte and exceed their storage and get like a Western Digital or some hard drive that's actually good and not a Seagate that's going to fail within a couple months anyways. Because they're cheaper and that's probably what they end up putting in these things. Now, and I don't know the exact hard drive they put in there, so don't take my don't take that as they're putting Seagates in there because I don't know. I don't know what hard drive they put in there, but nevertheless, I just kind of like buying my own hard drive. Moving on, talking about video quality of the TiVo, what is its maximum capabilities? It does have 4K HD resolution capabilities, and that antenna that from Antennas Direct that I have currently, the channel uh, Clearview. Clearstream, sorry, Clearstream 2V does have the ability to pick up 4K broadcasts. So it's future approved as well as this. So now all we're missing is a 4K TV and those are coming down in price. So you could already start future proof for 4K if you realistically wanted to. Now it also does record four shows at once, which is kind of cool. That's pretty much, you know, getting to be more of the standard now uh, of DVRs are all trying to work towards that. But really the standard still is kind of just two shows, at least a minimum of every DVR. You record one, uh, watch another, or record two shows and watch them on your DVR. You know, that's, that's pretty basic nowadays. Price-wise, what are you looking at? A little bit more expensive than the DVR Plus. You're gonna spend about $299 for the base model, 
or 399 for the one terabit model, which is the same as the DVR plus. With that said, my money would go, I would definitely put my money towards the TiVo Bolt. That's just my opinion. I already own the channel master. Well, it is a decent little uh, DVR. If you're gonna buy it, don't break the bank and pay that price, pay that price because it just ain't worth that price in my mind. Uh, as to the TiVo, from what I'm reading online, it looks like it's very promising, and I would definitely All right, so here we are it. at the television, and as you can see, the picture is quite clear. And uh, also down here, you can see I have my Channel Master, as mediocre as it is. And the remote is right here, is, well, very mediocre. Don't like how the play button and all the other DVR functions at the bottom, but uh, nevertheless, it is very thin, and that's kind of a downfall because it takes watch batteries in a sense instead of regular double or triple A's, which are which would because it makes it easier to replace the batteries. Anyways, let's take a look at the guide here because this does come with a guide, which is quite nice. So we'll start at the top here, my first channel, which is ABC on 2-1. Uh, we can scroll through like normal guides on any other cable or satellite provider. You can also scroll to the right and see different hours of the day. As you can see, all of my channels are listed right there. And then down here, you have those internet channels I was talking about earlier, but nothing in which I really care about. <laughs> so uh, let's go back to the guide here again. I'll just hit that. And then you can also go like anything else. You can skip ahead. I think that's the play. Yep, there you go. You can skip ahead uh, multiple days by like hitting the skip ahead button. And as you can see, you can go about two or three weeks, I think, in advance. Uh, looks like about uh, a week or two. So um, that's, that's quite nice. Uh, now you do have to have it connected to the internet, I believe, to have it go that far ahead. And unfortunately, you do have to have it connected through a LAN unless you were to buy the uh, Wi-Fi adapter. And as you can see down here, I do have my Ethernet switch in which I connect my surround system as well as my PlayStation 4. TV upstairs let me go ahead and turn this down here so we don't have to listen to those guys yak and uh, here you can see right to the wall I have the basically uh, the coax cable going right to the back of the television here as you can see it's right there all right everyone so we are currently in my basement right here and as you can see uh, we are getting perfectly good reception on even the weakest channel around in my area now this is a perfect example of why you'd want a rooftop antenna because the weakest channel you will definitely not be able to pick up in your basement. 
Uh, this is this is going to pose a huge issue due to the fact that you're underground. Now, even that TV you saw, first of all, uh, that was in my family room. That one could not pick up pretty much any channels clear. It was constantly pixelating, constantly breaking up with just a set-top antenna. So this is really an example of why a rooftop antenna is just gonna end up alleviating a lot of your problems. I mean, sure, you're gonna spend a lot more time in the sense of, let me change the channel here just so we can kind of get some other uh, programming on here. Uh, but anyways, it's gonna really alleviate a lot of your frustration because you have one antenna and it's outside, it can pick up the maximum amount of sing signal it can, and you're not gonna have to sit there and fart around with each antenna trying to figure out, okay, am I gonna get TV today? Or am I gonna have to sit there and struggle through and just get frustrated? Because TV's supposed to be relaxing, not more frustrations. So, as you can see in the basement, nothing whatsoever is posing a problem. Now I can't show you a signal because this TV does not have a signal meter. But we'll go ahead and move on, and uh, so it looks like everything is good down here. What about video quality, you say? Well, I'm going to tell you right now, right up front, that uh, your cable or satellite provider video quality is not going to compete with the over-the-air quality. And before you start commenting and griping and moaning and complaining and asking me, well, where the heck did you get that information? Well, let me tell you this. Cable and satellite compress that signal so that they can rebroadcast it, versus over the air, which uses no, little to no compression whatsoever. The more you compress that and the more you convert that video, the more video quality you lose. That's just how it goes. And it doesn't matter if you're broadcasting it, if you're editing video, the more you reconfigure video and re-encode it, it's gonna lose quality. So that is why, essentially, as you can see right here, over the air is superior. Now I did record this using my Elgato HD, so the quality is very good. However, once, like I said earlier, when you re-encode it, you lose quality. So in this case, it's going to be very, very close to a cable or satellite just due to the fact that I've re-encoded it. You're probably asking, well then why are you even showing this? Well, I'm really showing this just so that you guys can see this. It's not your grandma's uh, analog signal. It's not gonna break up as readily as you would think with an analog signal. I mean, you guys are probably all used to seeing snow, um, ghosting and stuff like that. You don't get that with a digital signal. It's either you get it or you don't. If there are missing components within that signal, you'll get pixelation in the sense of blocks missing and you'll, you've probably everybody seen that uh, even with your cable or satellite. Uh, so that, that is all you would get in here. So you have to make sure, and that's why I talked about earlier, getting the right antennas and getting the right equipment, because that's really, really going to help you in making sure that you can get that signal and get it at a very consistent stream versus broken up and things like that. But overall, if you do receive the signal very strongly and cleanly, it will be a superior signal than cable or satellite. You might not notice it as much, but it is going to be superior. And let me tell you this, I used to have Dish Network as my satellite provider, and when I were to, for example, watch a football game, I would notice that the over-the-air picture would be much more crisp than the uh, satellite version of that that was more compressed. So there is a lot of truth behind this. Uh, if you don't believe me, try to do a comparison yourself. Uh, plug an antenna in the back of your TV while you still have satellite or cable, and then go back and forth between the two channels and see if you notice any difference. And obviously I'm going to point out right now that, you know what? Some satellite providers and some cable providers do a better job at retransmitting the signal, so you may not notice a difference. Uh, but I'm just telling you my experience, I did notice a difference in mine, as well as many other people who have made this switch. Uh, if you just do a simple Google search, you will find the same information out there. All right, so now let's talk about watching cable networks without the cable price. What do you mean, watching cable networks? How the heck can you do that? I'm not stealing cable. You're not going to steal cable. You're going to use the modern technology and power of the internet to deliver your television. Yes, Netflix, which most of you have already heard about, Amazon Instant Video, which is quite cool in itself, and then Vudu and Hulu. Netflix overall is going to offer you a $10 a month subscription. Uh, that's kind of their most popular package, and that's going to get you HD streaming capabilities as well as access to their entire library. Amazon Instant Video, uh, if you pay, pay for Prime services, you get pretty much the same library as Netflix does, but in addition to that, you also get two uh, free 
free two-day shipping on any Prime eligible items. That's kind of a nice perk right there. And you get a whole bunch of other perks too with the Prime membership. That's going to cost you $100 a year, which is pretty much the same as Netflix. Voodoo, unfortunately, you have to pay for everything on there. There is no subscription fee to access their library. However, I find Voodoo has some of the best video quality out there when it comes to movies. Uh, Netflix is really good as well um, when it comes to video quality. Uh, they do have their Super HD or whatever they call it, and then Voodoo has what they call HDX. Don't know if it really does anything, but nevertheless, it might be a psychological thing. I think that they both have pretty good HD. Uh, comparing it to Amazon, you know, it's just average. It realistically isn't anything special. So, but you can also buy content. I don't know if I mentioned that already. You can buy content that is not available through your Prime membership and uh, add it to your library. So overall, if you're looking for more content, Amazon is probably gonna be your best bet. And also in a sense of diversity where you get included content via your subscription as well as ability to pay for content that is not available and add it to your streaming library. Hulu, I don't even know why I put that in there. I tried Hulu twice and I canceled it before the weekends and the second time I tried it. You can stream shows on your computer, but when you decide to go to a device such as a Roku stick or any other streaming device that is not a computer, you typically get locked out and are reduced down to clips of shows, not actual shows, which is to me pathetic considering they usually only have less than 10 clips per show. Whoop de freaking do, it's called a YouTube. That's better and it's free. So why would I pay for this? Now maybe I'm using it wrong, but from what I've found, that's realistically just not that economical for me to sit there and watch things on my computer. You could obviously get a home media PC, a home, yeah, home media PC, uh, make one of those and uh, essentially put it together and watch Voodoo or Hulu on there. But um, no, no, I just don't feel like doing that. So Hulu, not on my list of recommendations, but you get a free trial for I think seven days or a month, I don't know what it is. Go ahead, try it out. Not gonna cost you anything as long as you cancel before your uh, trial's up. All right, so cable, kind of. That's what I titled this slide. Because you can watch live TV online. Yes, you can. If you have a Roku stick, you can download the Sling app and essentially $20 a month will get you these channels right here in this bracket. And then for an additional $5 a month for each bracket, you can go ahead and uh, pick your sub package. Cool thing about this is it starts at only $20 a month. That's pretty cool itself. You can watch live TV, so what you're seeing on cable, you will see on here. No contracts, cancel any time. The only downfall realistically is it's can't record, first of all. That's kind of a downfall. And you can't, well, not legally, you can you can't legally record it. I'm sure there's ways around that. Uh, and another downfall. I thought there was another one that I'm failing to mention. Why am I forgetting about this? Shoot. Oh, well, uh, essentially, so that is Sling TV and its capability. And that's really bugging me why I can't remember that. But anyways, it may come to me later. If I do remember it, I will come back to that. So more cable alternative options. Now, this one I was kind of reluctant to throw in here due to the fact that it costs $50 a month and starting at $50 a month. It's kind of expensive. And now they have a deal right now, I think, where you can get it for $70 a month, the Elite Package, which will get you all of these channels right here. As you can see, that's kind of a lot of channels. Uh, and you can record this. You can cancel any time. There's no contracts whatsoever. So to me, this is how cable companies should act. Uh, they, they should get rid of all of these freaking stupid fees and things like that. And, and maybe people wouldn't be so angry with them. Because PlayStation so far is doing it a little bit more right now. You're probably asking yourself, why is it so expensive still? I mean, can't anybody give cheap TV? Well, let me explain to you the licensing of channels. Now, I'm going to try to briefly do this because it's kind of complicated. Basically, each channel has a licensing fee to broadcast them on a network. That network has to pay that fee. For instance, Disney... ESPN, which is I believe owned by Disney, are some of the highest ones out there. And last I heard it was like $15 a month or something of that sort. Some ungodly price to each subscriber that these cable companies have to pay. No, no, not, not just to lease the channel. No, no, it's not $15 a month. That's per subscriber they have to pay that $15. So do the numbers on that of how many subscribers. That's a lot of money right there. Now, essentially, how do they get that cost down? Because with that, you're probably thinking, man, that cost would go up quick. They have other channels that in turn have to pay to be on their network. 
and that in turn lets them drop their cost down. So when you do all the number crunching, their packages are built upon licensing fees. That is why if you look at National Geographic, typically those are on higher packages because I know, for instance, that one is a very high licensing fee as well uh, versus the base packages. You know, considering it's an educational show, you're thinking, why would it, why wouldn't it be on a family programming or family oriented channel or, or package? That's just because of the licensing fee once again. So that is a little insight on that. However, moving on, let's start talking about savings, guys. So this whole time, I've been, you know, obviously trying to explain to you how to set this up, and I know you've been waiting to you know how much you actually need to save. So here is a kind of table representing the savings that you're going to experience with the switch over. So your average cable bill doing a couple Google searches is going to run you about $100 a month. If you do the math, that's going to run you about $1,200 per year that you're spending on just TV. Yeah, it's a lot of money, guys. So let's take a look at the over-the-air options here. Now you're probably wondering yourself, oh, geez, 276. I see that down there. That just doesn't look like a month. That doesn't look like a lot of savings to me. And you're right. It, realistically, number-wise, that is not a lot of savings. And uh, if you were to go with this package that I have built right here, Netflix Standard, Sling TV, a season of show a month, which is you know quite a lot. Who buys a season of a show each month? I mean, you usually will buy a bunch of seasons, let's say if you watch a lot of shows, um, essentially in, in one big lump sum, let's say in the fall, but then during the summer when you're, it's a, you know, the down season of you know, TV networks putting out shows and things like that, you typically aren't buying any for a couple months. So I tried to get kind of an average, guys. Keep in mind, these, these numbers are all averages, so yours might differ greatly. Now, I don't have Sling TV at all, and this is this $25 a month is assuming you're going to buy a sub package. So let's say you wanted to buy the lifestyle package, get DIY, and, and things like that. That's what that's based off of. So around $77 per month, you're kind of at the point where you might just be able to keep cable if it's working for you and uh, not deal with this hassle because obviously Netflix is going to demand more in the way of bandwidth and you're going to have to get you know, upgrade your internet speed if you have a lot of people who are going to use it. So keep that in mind too. This is all things that you kind of have to kind of have to think about when it comes to switching over. And this is things that I went through uh, through the whole year. So keep that in mind. Let's look at our other scenario here. What do, what do we have here? So this is, let's say you want to get Netflix standard and you just realistically don't need to buy any TV shows. You just want to see what's on TV, see what's on Netflix and whatever they give you, you're willing to watch it. That's going to run you about $35 a month, which is going to equal to about $420 per year. And please do not comment on the specific number that is in this specific order on the screen relative to a specific date and a specific law enforcement code. Okay. I know there's going to be people commenting about that. But anyways, whatever. The savings, as you can see down here, is $780 a year. Now we're getting a little bit more more worth it, right? I mean, you can see we're still getting our TV experience. We're getting live TV channels through a cable, live TV cable channels, guys, keep in mind. And we're getting Netflix for savings of $780, equaling to only $420 a year versus our $1,200. So now we're really coming down. So here's another scenario, going back up a little bit. You want to buy that $42 uh, show which where I got that 42 guys that was the walking dead by the way I know it's a very popular show so I looked at how much the latest season of the walking dead will run you and that is pretty much what I got uh, also ten dollars and Netflix is gonna run you obviously fifty two dollars a month six hundred twenty four dollars a year equaling to a savings of five hundred seventy six pretty good all right so here is our other scenario right here and this is our last one so in this scenario you can see that we have Kale over here, obviously $1,200, and then we have Netflix. If you just have over the air with Netflix, that is going to run you a measly $120 a year. You're going to save $1,080 a year with what, 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 by getting rid of cable. That's it. $1,000 a year by getting rid of cable. That's quite a bit of money. That's, that's really kind of worth it, uh, especially if you really aren't watching it that much. So if you want more and you want to see more on kind of convince you, if you haven't been convinced yet, go over to Vlog Brothers channel and watch his video called Kill TV. And I'll put it in the, Kill Your TV, and I'll put it in the description because it's really kind of an interesting video. He kind of just touches on all the quirks that people have been putting up with and how cable has really just been going downhill and quite honestly is a failing technology. It is just not worth it anymore. So 
with that said, uh, let's go ahead and kind of close out this presentation here. So if you're having trouble after you set this up, you know, you went through all the setup, you bought all the stuff, and now you're getting frustrated, guys. And you're thinking, geez, why did I do this? I shouldn't listen to that idiot on YouTube. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, there's a troubleshooting guide in the, in the description. And uh, some of the most common problems are going to be, like I mentioned earlier, multipath. Short delay multipath is going to be your biggest enemy. Uh, and like I said, if you're experiencing that, try moving the antenna, re-aiming it, stuff like that, getting it away from metal objects. And, and first of all, try that. If re-aiming the antenna and, and kind of moving some things around isn't really necessarily doing it for you, Try plugging into a different TV uh, and, and isolating also your network out of the equation. So run one cable from the antenna to your TV, uh, taking everything else out of the equation, just so that you can verify that your TV tuner isn't bad. Uh, if you're still experiencing issues with that, maybe try a different TV just to verify that uh, you know your tuner isn't the issue. Uh, and, and obviously, if you're still having issues, um, you you may have something else relative to the to the broadcast towers. Now, keep in mind, they are human too, and they do have issues. In fact, recently, the CW14 uh, channel in my area, they had issues ever since Comet TV went on the air. Basically, I was getting pixelation on my TVs, all of them. Uh, I freaking out, tried to go up on the roof for Amy Antenna, thought to myself, what the heck is going on? Uh, couldn't figure it out, couldn't figure it out. I'm thinking multipath because that's when it was on that dang chimney. And um, ended up calling a couple days later the uh, channel and talked to their, one of their broadcast engineers. And he explained to me that they did have a processing issue with their video stream and that that was contributing to my breakup. It was nothing on the end of my signal. The signal was strong and they were broadcasting at full power. It was just the way they processed the video. Uh, there was a component that needed to be repaired and they, they were getting on that issue as soon as possible. So that's it guys, I really hope you enjoyed the video. I hope this answers a lot of your questions when it comes to uh, switching over to TV, whether you're gonna do it or not, in a sense of cost savings. So with that said, once again, hope you enjoyed it. Subscribe for more content in the sense of computer stuff because I'm not going to be really doing too much in the way of this TV stuff. I think this probably is going to be the only video you'll see on here. Uh, it's going to be, this channel is mostly uh, computer related, techie stuff, as well as mainly security reviews. I take a look at antiviruses and see which ones perform the best. So thanks for watching guys. Hope you subscribe. Hope you enjoyed the channel. Hope, well, hope you enjoyed the channel. Hope you enjoyed the video too and uh, hope to see you in another video. So with that said, see you guys later.